Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Paideia Institute online lecture series. Um, it is my great pleasure today to introduce Achilles Dematiadis, who holds a BA from Northeastern University in Government, History, and International Affairs. He is a Harvard GSAS program alumnus, having spent a research year in Cambridge, Massachusetts, focusing on comparative literature and classical studies and holds an MA degree in comparative literature, classics and leadership from the University of Chicago. Achilles is now pursuing a doctoral degree and focusing on models of humanistic leadership, Renaissance studies and the revival of civic consciousness um, Achilles feels that the humanities have a lot to teach us about world human values and aspires to call himself a humanist one day. Um, the title of this talk, um, related to Achilles's most recent publication, is Heavenly and Terrestrial Aphrodite from Pre-Socratic to Victorian Times. I'll now hand it over to you. Thank you so much for this lovely introduction, dearest Megan. And I would like this opportunity to start by warmly thanking Nicolette and um, Marco and Jason for the honor to speak to you today. My lecture will try to demonstrate the prevalence of Plato's philosophical model of the twin Venuses as it manifested itself at certain points in the continuum of Western literature. Whether Aphrodite is single or double, Urania or Pandemos, I don't know. Zeus, who always seems to remain the same, has many titles. Thus, Socrates, in Xenophon's Symposium, attempts to rebut Pausanias' speech. Scholars throughout the centuries have acknowledged the view of Xenophon's Socrates that there is really no difference between the two Aphrodites that Plato describes. However, about 25 years earlier, than Xenophon, in Plato's Symposium, and especially in the speech of Pausanias, uh, we see an important distinction, namely that between two types of Aphrodite, Aphrodite Urania and Aphrodite Pandemos, both of which were later called Plato's Twin Venuses. As we will see, the concept of the Twin Venuses isn't monolithic, rather it exhibits great malleability throughout the ages. My analysis of the twin Venuses as a bifurcative model will concentrate mainly on three primary sources, Plato's Symposium, Ficino's Commentarium in Convivium Platonis, and Tennyson's Lucretius. Specifically, I will focus on the philosophical and allegorical significance of Aphrodite as expressed primarily in Pausanias' speech in Plato's Symposium, and go on to examine how Ficino developed this distinction in his commentarium, and how Tennyson, in his poem, interpreted the suicide of Lucretius, who was arguably possessed by a Venus resembling Aphrodite Pandemus. Moreover, my analysis of Plato's model concerns both the relation of the twin Venuses to the Platonic dialogue and allegorical readings of the figure of Aphrodite in pre-Socratic, Platonic, and Neoplatonic philosophy. I will then follow the diachronic development and reception of Plato's twin Venuses, taking into consideration a broad range of later sources, from Hellenistic antiquity down to the 19th century. In a nutshell, my argument is that Plato's bifurcative model, or the influence thereof, reappears and evolves throughout Western literature. My analysis begins with the description of primordial attributes of Venus recognized since the time of pre-Socratic philosophy, followed by, by a consideration of the bifurcative model itself, as described by Pausanias' speech in Plato's Symposium. Within Plato's philosophical circle, Aphrodite Urania and Aphrodite Pandemos were related but distinct concepts. Moreover, this distinction, so prominent in the speech of Pausanias, permeates, permeates the thought of Plotinus, Ficino, and over time leads to further celestial and terrestrial conceptions of the goddess. In Neoplatonism, Persianus' division corresponds to the division between Venus Celestis, which corresponds to Urania, and Venus Pulkivaga, which corresponds to Pandemus. The transformative nature of this reception and the ensuing concepts of Anteros and Eros will also be a subject of my diachronic investigation. 
I will conclude with two observations on the conceptual development and versatility of the twin Venuses, highlighting the prevalence and tenacity of Plato's birth vocative model. And I would like, if you allow me now, to also share my screen, because I would also like to add some slides to our discussion. Let me just quickly trace the correct slide. Okay, here we are. In the remaining fragments of Empedocles, the philosopher talks about Nakos, the personification of strife, as a separating force in the universe. It would appear, as we read in the fragments, that in the beginning there were four primary elements, or rhizomata, namely earth, fire, water, and air. Those four elements were separated by Nakos and remained separated in this primary form of the cosmos. It was through the force of philotis, or love, that primary elements came together, forming all organic matter. Arguably, if one considers that the author of the Derveni Papyrus took philosophical inspiration from Empedocles and describes a similar kind of Aphrodite Urania, or Aphrodite Urania, joining elements together, we may argue that in Empedocles too, the elements were joined under the influence of a primordial force, which is simply described as Aphrodite in Empedocles. Much like Aphrodite Urania of the Delveni Papyrus, Empedocles' Aphrodite acts as a divine and celestial personification of Philotis. However, a completely different Aphrodite appears in Plato's Symposium. At the beginning of the dialogue, and especially in the second speech of Pausanias of Athens, Aphrodite Urania is mentioned. However, preceding that reference to Urania, we encounter Aphrodite Pandemos, a quite different Aphrodite whose influence, if left untamed, can lead to destructive results. In Pausanias' speech, we further discover two discrete types of love. The first type, associated with Pandemos, is base love, a profane type, under the influence of which the lover looks only for sexual gratifications or carnal lusts. Herosi ton somaton malon, u ton psikon. The second emergent type of Aphrodite, um, and, 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 and hence the second emergent type of love, is related to heavenly Aphrodite Urania, which encourages us to love honorably, kalos protrepon heran. Moreover, Love under the influence of Urania concerns honoring pariter, at the same time, a partner's soul, tompsikon, intelligence and wisdom, a condition and tinged with wantonness, as we read in the text. As Socrates notes in the symposium, philosophers ought to pursue the second type of love. This pursuit becomes a tenet of what is later known as Platonic philosophy. And here you see some early depictions of both Urania, Aphrodite, uh, from the one you see on your right is from Aphrodisias and, uh, and, and, and also Pendemos. I should like to move to this slide now to continue uh, with my presentation. Caliroi, the first century CE novel by Hariton of Aphrodisias has many references to aspects of Aphrodite Urania, who is persistently invoked to safeguard the sacred union of Caliroi and Heraeus throughout their many adventures. Both the language used and the rituals, the rituals followed, la pomeni de autes, umenfomai soi, despoina, teomai su, are suggestive of the worship of Urania. From an archaeological standpoint, a further hint is that the shrine of Aphrodite described by Hariton reminds us of a description of the shrine of Aphrodite Urania described by Persanius in his description of Athens while surveying the area of Olympia in Elis. The upward position of the statue of Aphrodite in Hariton and the melodious lyre sounding voice of Caliroi, a human counterpart of Aphrodite, are, I believe, suggestive of attributes of heavenly Aphrodite. If we consider uh, the argument that Brody makes that doves closely associated with the cult of worship of Aphrodite and Rainy were protected, were protected. Uh, it is 
Yeah, yes. Um, can you please unmute yourself? Um... I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Where where was I? Left? Oh, um, I had to mute everyone because there was an echo. So, um, okay. just right where you left off. Okay. Okay. So, if we consider an argument made by a scholar called Brody that doves closely associated with the cultic worship of Aphrodite Urania were protected in Aphrodisias during the Hellenistic period, we may in a justifiable way claim that the cult of Aphrodite in Aphrodisias during the time of Heriton was evidently that of Urania. It is highly likely that Heriton may have had in mind, prior to composing his novel, cultic imagery of Aphrodite Urania found in Caria and Aphrodisias. Here we may see some archaeological remnants from a temple of Aphrodite in Aphrodisias. Uh, moving on, in the Judgment of Paris, a myth likely narrated for the first time in the Cupria, but eventually preserved by later authors, the choice among lives of different sorts is hinted. The regal life is represented by Hera. And I think I have a slide. Oh, yes, this is a much better slide. Uh, the regal life is represented by Hera. Uh, the philosophical life is represented by Athena. And the erotic life by Aphrodite. I would argue that in retellings of the myth, such as Ovid's, the tripartite distinction of lives appears yet again. In Ovid's Heres, for example, we become aware of an Aphrodite representing a life of pleasure, a Hera representing regal power, and Athena representing wisdom and valour, essential traits of a philosophical life. The association of Aphrodite with a life of pleasure, in my view, hints to aspects of Aphrodite Pandemos, which have been preserved in myth. Ioannis Dedis, uh, the 12th century grammarian, here we go, uh, um, the 12th century grammarian of uh, and tutor of uh, Empress Bertha von Sulzbach or Empress Irene upon her marriage to Manuel Komnenos was commissioned to produce allegories of the Iliad, a lengthy poem of 24 books, the organization of which reflects the epic's original division by Alexandrian editors. In book three, in a dialogue between Hector and Paris, Hector addresses his next of kin. Uko felici si udeni musiki thanondi, u kalos, ude trichosis, dorets avroditis, it un epithimiaste, ite ke tu asteros. This reference to Aphrodite in Zedzi's poem, in Zedzi's poem, alludes to the distinctive aspects of the goddess. I believe that the star in Zedzi's poem uh, alludes to the heavenly topos of Aphrodite Urania, and that also reminds us of archaeological remnants. Uh, that we have found in Aphrodisias, where Aphrodite is always portrayed wearing a crown, which also has a star. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, while desire may uh, similarly be associ associated with aspects of Aphrodite Pandemos, in fact, while Zedzis notes that his reference means that those born under the planets of Aphrodite are imbued with sexual desirability, that is characteristic of the goddess, he also seems to be aware of both aspects of Venus at other points throughout his narrative. In his prolegomenon to the allegories of the Iliad, he reveals the true allegorical nature of the three goddesses in the judgment of Paris myth, namely Athena, who is wisdom, Hera, who is bravery, and lust, by which I mean Aphrodite. It is clear to me that here he refers to lustful attributes also associated with Aphrodite Pandemos. However, uh, at yet another point within his prolegomenon, he refers to Aphrodite as the harmonious mixture of all the bonded elements. This second reference most clearly illumines aspects of Aphrodite Urania, as we've also discussed earlier. And I should like to move to the Renaissance period now. Marsilio Ficino, arguably one of the most important Renaissance humanists, mentions that in honor of Plato's symposium, uh, and um, I'm sorry, in honor of Plato's birthday on November 7th, a banquet was held that commemorated both his birthday and his death, which coincidentally occurred on that day as well. 
This ritual celebration was reenacted by all early and late Platonists, from Plotinus all the way up to Porphyry. True to this tradition, the Neoplatonic Academy of Ficino met on November 7th, 17, um, 17, uh, 1475, at the Villa Medicea di Careggi in the Florentine Hills. The so-called Academy consisted of nine members. Diotifeci Ficino, the physician, who was the father of Marsilio Ficino, Cristoforo Landino, the poet, Antonio Agli, uh, the bishop of Fiesole, Bernardo Nuzzi, a rhetorician, Tommaso Benci, Giovanni Cavalcanti, the two Maruspini brothers, Cristoforo and Carlo, and finally, Bandini. Faithful also to the original structure of Plato's Symposium, where a group of notable Athenian men gathered at the house of Agathon to discuss the topic of Eros. A similar structure seems also to have been followed here, whereby after Bernardo Nuzzi read the symposium to the attendants, each of the humanists introduced above provided an explanation of one of the symposium speeches they had heard. For example, the speech of Persenius was given to Agni, that of Eryximachos, the physician, to Diotifeci Ficino, while the poet Aristophanes was interpreted by Landino. In the speech of Agli, which concerns Persenius' distinction of the twin Venuses, the bishop makes important observations about the so-called double nature of Venus. Agli associates Venus Urania with the concept of the angelic mind, and Venus Pandemos with the concept of the world soul. He says that Urania is by nature incorporeal, while Pandemos is related to matter and has by nature the ability to beget lower forms. One aspect of Venus, namely that of Aphrodite Urania, is for Agli connected with intelligence and the angelic mind, while another, that of Pandemos, is related to the power of generation with which the so-called world soul is endowed. This is the area in which the symposium uh, of Ficino uh, took place. Uh, and here you see uh, those different levels that I'm describing. The sensible world, which is kind of the, the first level. Uh, the world soul, or anima mundi, which is a level above. Nous, which is a level above. And the one, which is a level above. Um, According to Ada Palmer, the Platinian model divides the universe into five layers. These layers include the one, mind, soul body, and formless matter beneath. These layers correspond in the, their Christian adaptation to God, for one, angels or intelligences for mind, soul, and evil as formless matter. This observation seems to underlie the concept of the angelic mind in Agli's account as an idea associated with the realm of the so-called mind in Plotinus. Commensurately, the world soul of Agli would correspond to the Plotinian soul, which is only one level higher than evil and formless matter. The influence of Plotinian ideas on Ficino and his circle has of course been attested by several scholars. And as we know, Ficino himself published the complete works of Plotinus a couple of years after his commentary on the Platonic Symposium. It is clear to me from the above passages from Ficino's commentarium that Ficino had obviously understood and appreciated the conceptual underpinnings of Plato and Plotinus and was thus able to use the teachings of Plotinus to better perceive and teach the Platonic thoughts. In addition, Agli, as a Catholic bishop, had his ideas undoubtedly influenced by the intellectual framework of early Christian theology, and perhaps even the theological works of Aquinas, which, as Palmer has shown, came very close to ideas developed by Ficino in his theology, in his Platonic theology. At any rate, in both Agli's speech and throughout the commentary on the Platonic Symposium, we find information on how the Renaissance received Plato's twin Venuses. The prevalence of a heavenly Venus who is divine and a terrestrial Venus who is clearly closer to matter and material things manifests the distinct nature of two different types of love. Once we understand that heavenly love uh, is a non-bodily concept, while terrestrial love is related to body, form and matter, we can also become aware of why Ficino appreciates the heavenly love described by Diotima. 
in, in Plato's Symposium. For Vicino, it is clear from a letter he sends to Bernardo del Nero, a politician of Florence at the time, and Antonio Manetti, um, that people have been led astray at his time uh, by bodily or terrestrial conceptions of love. Therefore, in Vitrino's mind, the non-bodily love described by Diotima ought to be revived through his commentary to move one's intellect from the love of beautiful bodies, which is the first level, to the love of beautiful souls, which is a higher level, and to a further contemplation of the idea of beauty itself, which is also associated with what is noble and what is just and what is virtuous and what is good and what is beautiful. Uh, from a contemplation of the idea of beauty itself, Ficino believes that beautiful actions in the realm of politics, lawmaking, and philosophy uh, will ensue, uh, such as the one that Diotima describes in the symposium. This love, uh, this type of love, would, as a cure, heal the souls of Renaissance men of letters, thus leading them towards acts of virtue. According to Ficino, the goal of Platonic philosophy is for the initiate to eventually become godlike in a state of eternal bliss. Furthermore, as Vicino points out in his preface to his Commentaria Platonis, religion, which is the only way to happiness, ought to be a common truth, not only for the more uh, cultivated members of society, but also for, the, for, uh, the, for uncultivated members of society. Ficino, in fact, underlies in his commentary on Plato's Philebus that the desire for God is inborn in all. And that is a much older tradition, uh, a tradition that we are all, uh, in a way, parts uh, of the nos, uh, the mind, the nous, uh, which is the divine mind, and we're all kind of manifestations of this divine mind. And hence, when we're performing good actions, the divine mind is happy when we're performing evil actions. The divine mind is 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 unhappy. Um, I shall now like to move to Tennyson. Give me a few seconds. I've got a lot of slides. Here. Um, Of course, I also mentioned the concepts of eros and anteros. And what's interesting to note here is that the concept of anteros develops from the concept of urania, because anteros represents this mirroring effect that happens to our soul, as Ficino describes, when we love another person. And what we do, the first thing that we do when we love another person is that we, uh, we give a part of our soul to the other person that we love. And once we do that, we die, and uh, and the other person, uh, or to safeguard uh, that piece of our soul that they have received, and give it back to us. And if they do that, then they die, and we become resurrected, and we be and there's a renaissance. And then we preserve their soul and we give it back to them, and then we die. And then through this constant death and rebirth, death and rebirth that um, that Ficino describes both parts reach uh, immortality and reach the idea of the good. So uh, this mirroring effect that I just described and that Ficino describes is closely associated with uh, uh, Aphrodite Urania, while um, uh, just the carnal conception of love is associated with, with Eros and, 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 and hence with Pandemos. So Eros is associated with Pandemos and Teros with Urania. In the plate that you see, uh, Urania is wearing a red dress and she's dressed and Pandemos is naked. I should like to move, and, and there are many other beautiful depictions of this. I should like to move to, to Tennyson. Ah, uh, here we go. Okay. The myth of Celestis and Vulgivaga was, uh, or 
Urania and Pandemos was prevalent in art and literature during the 18th century and remained so in Britain during the era of Victorian poetry, not least in, the poem by, in a poem by Tennyson, which describes the sufferings of Lucretius at the end of his life. Tennyson's poem reveals that um, he was a close leader, a reader of Lucretius's Dererum Natura. A good example of his familiarity with the Lucretian text appears in his lines concerning Holy Venus. Forgetful how my rich premium makes thy glory fly among the Italian fields in lays that will outlast thy deity. I also cite this poem because Tennyson bases his composition on an ancient source, albeit a questionable one, uh, which is, uh, of course, the, the source of Z Jerome, which uh, there's now a big debate if it was Eusebius or Jerome or something like this. As we read in Tennyson, Lucilla, Lucretius's wife, becomes wrathful upon seeing her husband so called, with his mind half buried in some heavier argument as he rereads the Epicurean scrolls, uh, which writings he considered divine. Lucilla imagines uh, that there is some rival for her husband's affection. Um, and such is her jealousy, jealousy that she seeks help from a witch to prepare a filter, which she is told would have the power to lead an errant passion home again. When Lucretius drinks this potion, he behaves as if he were possessed by Aphrodite Pandemos. He starts dreaming of Heterai, and then again of the breasts of Helen, and hooveringly a sword, now over, now under, now direct, pointed itself to peers. These nightmares, at odds with the Picurian teachings, made Lucretius, according to Tenson, feel utterly ashamed, and ultimately led to the poet philosopher's own death by means of a suicide. Interestingly, as we read in Martin's biography, Tennyson himself was preoccupied with what he saw as dangerous sexual license around the time the poem was composed. Martin further describes Tennyson as having been throughout his life, and more so as he grew older, very prudish in his attitudes towards sex. Such a predisposition brings Tennyson's poem closer to Lucretius, who also recognizes the deleterious effects of passion. Lucretius's mental pathology, as described by Tennyson in his poem, reminds us of both the end of Book Six of the Rerum Natura and the Plague of Athens passage in Thucydides. Passages like the following, when passing through the throat, the force of the disease had filled the breast and had flowed down into the sorrowful heart of the sick. Then truly, all the bonds of life began to torture. I believe show um, and reveal the author's preoccupation uh, with anatomy and medicine, characteristic interests he shares with Thucydides, who was arguably a predecessor of Lucretius in describing plagues. It is also exemplified by Lucretius's description that just as the body is subject to disease, so also the mind is subject to intense anxieties and fear. For Lucretius, the anxieties of love can in some ways be associated with anxieties caused by disease. As a matter of fact, Cupido is perceived as a disease for which the word of the philosopher may be the cure. This word being delivered in much the same way as a doctor administers unpleasant wormwood uh, to his younger patients in a cup with sweet golden honey around its rim, uh, so that these patients unsuspectingly, unsuspectingly may drink the whole bitter juice and be healed, uh, reminds us uh, of Lucretius that there's no, reminds us of the fact that uh, Lucretius points out that there is no profit in philosophy, if it does not expel the sufferings of the mind. In, ma in fact, the role of philosophy for Lucretius is to prevent a life left prey to its passions. The plague episode at the very end of Dererum Natura emphasizes, in my view, the cyclicity of life, 
Lucretius begins his poem with an invocation to Venus Urania, and later in his poem presents the perils of Venus Vulcivaga, where the goddess is presented as a cataclysmic force if left untamed. In fact, as we as we notice, um, it is human ignorance that leads to Venus Vulcivaga, and as uh, Asmus has pointed out, had humans known better, they would have chosen a Venus who may have led them to knowledge, namely a truer kind of Venus, representing both uh, natural and poetic creation. Uh, at the end of Lucretius's book six, humanity in totality, along with the divine apparatus, participates in the morbid atmosphere of the plague. Lucretius seems to be making the point that in facing such a calamitous atmosphere, even the divine loses its splendor, gradually succumbing to the intensity of grief. The poem of Lucretius therefore comes full circle, especially as Venus gives light and life in the poem's uh, poem. Um, uh, life matures in, book, in books two to five, and finally the plague in book six leads to mortality as the poem's epilogue. As we have seen, different manifestations of Venus Aphrodite reflect antithetic conceptions of love. I started my lecture by examining both pre-Socratic and Platonic philosophy, and I'm now concluding with Tennyson, thus spanning diachronically many of the various permutations of the figure of Aphrodite. Aphrodite Urania is assimilated to Anteros, in her, Renaissance, in, in her Renaissance reception. Urania represents heavenly love, while Pandemos is assimilated to Eros and represents terrestrial love. Similar ideas reach Neoplatonic circles and permeated uh, Renaissance humanism. Every place and every era seems to have its own interpretation of Aphrodite. Sometimes, there are overlapping interpretations. At other times, there are metapoetic treatments of the literary topos with different outcomes. What matters is that, is that each era utilizes the bifurcative model of Plato to meet its own ends, as evinced primarily by the examples of Ficino and Tennyson. In essence, the conclusion of my lecture is that a form of non-bodily love such as the ones exhibited by Platonic Aphrodite Urania, may indeed lead to a more virtuous life. For Ficino, in his initiation into the mysteries of love, as expressed in Diotima's speech, can indeed create better leaders by guiding humans who've been led astray back to an understanding of their ultimate divine source. The unification of the philosopher's soul with its divine source remains the absolute summit of a philosophical life, according to Plato. And here, I'm also reminded of the words of Herbert Y. Smythe, when he says that, as the immortal part of us, the soul can gain through purification, through moral asceticism, the beatific vision, which is its ultimate source. Since man in his essential nature is divine, his higher purpose is to become like unto God to therefore pass through the gates of death, is to attain to the supreme good. Through an understanding of the nature of heavenly love, we may hope to attain to the supreme good of Platonic philosophy. Aphrodite Urania is, after all, the only one holding the secrets of eternity, and the secret of eternity and immortality, according to Plato. Much like Ficino in Florence, when he composed his commentarium, Tennyson was much preoccupied by what he saw as the appalling state of morals in London around the time he wrote Lucretius. Unlike Ficino, however, who chose to rectify this state of morals by reminding his fellow humanists of a heavenlier perception of beauty and the good, via the Mantinean woman style of the Socrates, Tennyson chooses another route. For Tennyson, the suicide of a philosopher who is destroyed by the intrusion of overwhelming passion into his rationalistic world serves as a warning to where one's excessive passions may lead. 
Venus Pandemus, uh, Pandemos, who exemplifies sensual pleasure, may be seen by some as promoting less lasciviousness. In Tennyson's poem, Lucretius is arguably possessed by imagery resembling the lasciviousness attributed to Venus Pandemus. That in itself is deleterious, and as I argue, may lead to a mental pathology similar to the one described by Lucretius in Book 4 and Book 6 of De Rerum Natura. Alas, as Lucretius points out, the word of the philosopher can be the cure of such pathology by way of safeguarding one's life against one's passions. Throughout this diachronic analysis of Plato's bifurcative model, I have attempted to shed new light on the application of Plato's bifurcative model to literary texts of different eras. Such an analysis matters as authors as different as Ficino and Tennyson have advertently, in the case of Ficino, or inadvertently, as in the case of Tennyson, tailored the use of Plato's twin Venuses to conform to their own uh, personal aims. A diachronic analysis of Plato's bifurcative model underlies the power and tenacity uh, and the semantic prevalence of an allegorical interpretation of philosophical and terrestrial Venus. Most classicists will focus on the classical text itself and its direct meaning, but it is perhaps the work of a comparativist to examine whether Plato's model may also have further applications. I hope to have shown that it does. And moving on to some pictures and slides that I would like to analyze. Uh, here you see a beautiful illustration of Venus from the Renaissance manuscript, uh, the Sfera d'Esta, where you see both sides very clearly. Because as you will notice, in a diagonal fashion, you have the bull, which is representative of desire and passion, which is diagonally uh, in the same line, um, diagonally as the rose, representing passion and the passionate aspects of Aphrodite, which are, we find in the figure of Pandemos. And on the other hand, you've got Libra, which is a celestial sign of cosmic harmony. And uh, Libra is diagonally uh, facing the mirror, uh, which, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is, is, is a word that we find in, 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 in Phaedrus, the mirroring effects of, 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 of Anteros, and, and it is through the mirroring um, of one's soul, as Ficino describes, uh, that, that both parties, uh, when in love, may reach uh, to the supreme understanding of, of good, of the good. And may I also, uh, uh, having mentioned that, conclude uh, today's lecture with a few lines uh, from um, a poem that I really like uh, by Spencer, which is on, on heavenly beauty, uh, which again describes this idea that we find in Ficino that kind of our soul emanates from the good and forever turns back to the good by means of the good. I will now read from Spencer's poem. But that immortal light which there doth shine is many thousand times more bright, more clear, more excellent, more glorious, more divine, through which to God all mortal actions here and even the thoughts of men do plain appear. For from the eternal truth it doth proceed, through heavenly virtue, which her beings do breed. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, let me leave you with a sound, um, which to my mind is one of the most uh, poignant um, uh, manifestations of uh, the effects uh, to our soul uh, 
of, uh, of, 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 of an encounter with beauty and of an encounter with um, heavenly beauty, the heavenly beauty of Aphrodite Urania. Uh, I would like to end with this piece by Ramon and then take in your questions. Thank you so very much once again. Thank you so much. Um, we now have time for some questions. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, you can use the hand raise function. Um, you can just speak um, and mute yourself and speak, or um, you may also write your question in the chat. Who shall be the brave one to start? It's always difficult for me to ask questions at the end of lectures, so I understand how you're feeling. But please, I invite you to start. I've got a question. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you for this very enlightening talk. I was wondering to what extent do you say that we could sort of explain many of the problems of the modern era um, by thinking of this double nature on Venus and the one that is perhaps most prevalent in our times? if that question makes sense. It's a beautiful question. Thank you so much for, for asking it. Um, well, you know, the relevance of such conceptions is always uh, what um, humanists are trying to figure out uh, diachronically. And sometimes it's easier to figure it out and other times it's, it's more difficult. Um, but certainly I think that, you know, being able to teach the leaders of this world today that in order to love, it, you not only have to conquer someone else. In other words, you not only have to, 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 to completely conquer them, uh, but you can also love their external beauty. And you can also learn a lot of things from their external beauty is I think a very important lesson. And I certainly see that as a very important message from Plato's Symposium. And I certainly see the value of that 
because I see that the value of that is that it may also lead to more peace in the world. And I'm also reminded that in earlier depictions uh, of, of this bifurcative model, because this bifurcative model goes even further back to pre-Socratic sources, as I mentioned earlier, to, to Empedocles, um, you know, there's there's also a figure of 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 a divine feminine figure in in, in Parmenides, obviously, um, but also it goes back to to uh, another source which which I forgot to mention, but which is which is extremely important, which is Prodicus, because in Prodicus's seasons, we don't see, um, you know, the philosopher kind of having to decide between. Celeste, the celestial root of heavenly Aphrodite and the terrestrial root of, of terrestrial Aphrodite. But we actually see Hercules himself uh, having to make this choice. And he has to make the choice uh, in this lost work uh, called Hore, or Seasons, or Prodigus. He has to make the choice between um, um, virtue on the one hand and, 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 and malice and evil on the other hand. So to be able to follow the road of virtue and to be able to associate the, role, the, the road of virtue with a conception of beauty, a conception of to agathon, what is noble, what is just, what is honorable, uh, what, is, what is special um, because of its intrinsic value and because of its intrinsic light is I think very, very important and, and may indeed lead to more peace. So that is my hope, that is my aspiration, and I would hope that indeed such concerts uh, you know, were, were studied by more individuals throughout the world, because I think that they, are, they're really, they really cross cultures and boundaries and ethnicities. They really speak to the human soul. And I'm reminded here of the beautiful saying of Jacqueline de Omilly, who mentioned that I like these ideas that I study in Greek philosophy, because they teach me a lot of things about what is humane. And what is humane can also, in some ways, be universal. So that is my hope and that is my aspiration, studying those sources, that, that, that we may figure out uh, more and more as we study them, how we can apply in our everyday lives uh, those concepts and how we can be nourished by such concepts to become better and to become more developed as citizens and as individuals and as human beings. I'm sorry that this was a, a, an unexpected blackout, but I'm, I'm, I'm back and resurrected and with you <laughs> and ready to take on some more questions. And I'm so sorry for distressing all of you. I'm now at another house, so you see a different background. But please, let's continue uh, another family house. Let's continue with your questions. Well, I, I just mentioned that in the New Testament, the word for love is agape. Yes. And one of our participants said that eros doesn't really appear, and I'll have to check for that. But um, do you have any ideas about that? I was going to say agape is more oh, agape, love. Agape. Agape is such a profound word because, you know, we, we've got John who says that God is agape, right? God is love. And, yes. and, and, and then we've got St. Paul and the, his speech uh, to the Corinthians, which is all about agape. Mm -hmm. And all about, the word he uses is agape. Yes. And agape is both a brotherly love um, that, that Jesus exhibits throughout his life. As, as the good shepherd and as the good teacher who is near his students, who loves his students. But it is also exhibited in, 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 in Leviticus, in the, in the Judaic tradition, where you know, we, we find the concept that we should love our neighbor as ourselves, which I find very, very, you know, I find that you know, within that line from Leviticus, you know, we, we kind of have the intrinsic nature of agape. And um, and and to my mind, it is it is a very profound word, and it is a very deep word, and and certainly, I, I would relate it to 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 heavenly concepts rather than terrestrial concepts. 
at least fr from my from my understanding of it. Yes. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> oh, no, that's good. I'd like to look it up. I have a Septuagint. I'll look up Leviticus and see what language they use there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we do have a question in the chat. Please, uh, please. Mahmoud, would you like to ask your question or shall I read it? Okay, I'll read the question. Um, the question is, I would like to ask why did you choose Pausanias exactly not Phaedrus or Aristophanes or Socrates or are there other reasons except um, except of his Aphrodite division? Very much for us. I did Pausanias exactly but he just uh, in this bifurcative model, which only meant the same as Celestis or Urania and Pandemos. And I was trying to, to understand and conceptualize it and to also try to see if it applies to later period after. Uh, so this was the reason why I thought we are the same person. They are all uh, and, and read and the many men uh, take and to think so thank you very much for this question that's my reply would there be another one yes we have one more question in the chat um madeline would you like to read your question go ahead okay um can you speak further on how Aphrodite's dual nature was actually conceived. This would doubtless depend on which context, author, poet, philosopher we're speaking of. But for example, in the symposium, are the two sides simply two characteristics of the goddess or two really distinct sides of her, like Jekyll and Hyde, or more like two separate people? Beautiful question. <laughs> I can sympathize. I can understand it very well because I've read the night and it really resonates. Not exactly like Jekyll and Hyde. Um, I think that, you know, archaeologists, I mean, if you look at archaeologists like Grimal, you will see that they mention that, you know, Aphrodite is one figure. You, know, you can't really separate, at least in archaeological evidence. Uranian and Pandemos. But within Plato's philosophical, there appears to be this distinction which applies to philosophers between Aphrodite uh, is concerned the mother and celestial things and on and uh, what is good and a terrestrial Aphrodite which is concerned more base things. Um, so for philosophers, there appears to be this distinction, and it would be important to 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 conclude that distinction exists. What of them to as as a, as a framework of thought? Um, you know how to to better visual of the good uh, and manifestation of the good, which are not as auspicious as the more beneficial. Ones. Uh, and and that in itself has its own value. Uh, but you know, even though I say no, Aphrodite is one figure, uh, Lawsuit would say that it would perhaps be interesting to think of Aphrodite, uh, you know, have, as, as having a double name, as having both a celestial or heavenly nature, Urania, and a terrestrial nature, Pandemos, uh, because in this way, we can also understand conceptions like, uh, you know, the supreme good, which is associated with the heavenly realm, and things like matter and carnal lust, and and, and you know, just simply concerning ourselves with the body, which which may lead to idleness and wantonness and 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 even evil in excess, I guess. So, uh, you know, that is. That is uh, my reply. Um, 
and even evil if left untamed. And in fact, to amend my previous reply, uh, would 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 someone wish to ask something else? Oh, I I do see another question, but someone someone wanted to ask. Someone, I see a question just, from Annalisa. Yes. Um, would you like to ask a question? Annalisa is asking, can you speak more to Ficino's angelic mind and how it represents Urania? How it represents? Can you repeat the, the last bit of the question? Yes. Um, can you speak more to Ficino's angelic mind and how it represents Urania? On you. Uh, well, that, that's that's an interesting question. Well, his his angelic mind is uh, is certainly, to my understanding, at a higher realm than uh, his conception of anima mundi, with which he associates pandemos. So he he seems to be associating Urania with angelic mind, which one level below which is the highest and he seems to be associated with Pantimos um, which is only one level of matter and what is evil so that is kind of the distinction that I am perceiving in, in his speech um, uh, but uh, you know I guess uh, there are other interpretations but at least I'm offering you mine uh, for the discussion which is which is which is this one? Yes. Would there be an, other questions? Things that you'd like us to discuss? Uh, Diana, go ahead. Thank you so much for this talk and for staying. Um, I have a student who is in her research trying to tease out the the kind of primordial tension between time, Kronos and Eros. And I was just wondering um, if there was that same duality in your view or Eros Uranios and Eros Pandemos and, and maybe point me to uh, or her to some uh, sources besides the abundant visual ones and some literary ones, but that tension between love and time. And time, yes, that's a beautiful, beautiful concept, and certainly, love um, may pass the boundaries of time uh, because it exists. Will more of um, of kind of the the phenomenology of things in, in which we all we all operate. It exists also in the level of the ontology. So, you know, kind of thinking of pondering about those two conceptions, I would say that love is timeless. Love is diachronic. Uh, love may diachronically timeless way out. Um, and therefore, time knows no uh, love knows no boundaries. Uh, uh, other ways to combine those two terms, and just my mind, I took like the concept of remembering you know, after death. You know, we when, when we talk about people that have died passed away into this next reality, we say, which is related to God in my in my mind to my mind, um in my mind's conception, we say we're remembering them and and, and uh, we are met Peter of their existence, of their memory, and we're bring back those pieces to bring them back to life. So we're essentially using Ronos in the sense that we are kind of using Kronos to gather up memories, gather up 
a memory of the past existence and then we are we're remembering back those small pieces of the memory of their past existence through our love um to to remember them so uh, in a way i do see many many connections between time and love and thank you so much for this this question that really uh, a new, i would say and a new of exploration so thank you so much it's thank you well thank you so much um achilles and thank you to everybody who asked questions um it was a great talk <laughs>